everyone, and welcome to Talks at Google. My name is Leslie Pace, and I will be your host today. We have the opportunity to chat with one of the next generation of medical minds, Malone Mukwende. Malone is a medical student based out of the United Kingdom, equitable organization founder, and author of Mind the Gap, a handbook of clinical signs in black and brown skin. Welcome, Malone afternoon in fact good morning good morning to where you are Hi. good morning good evening for you we are all in different time zones but that's the beauty of technology right <laughs> so glad to have you today um, and for those who are tuning in on youtube if you do have questions please feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll be able to address those during our q a session at the end all right, Malone. So you at this juncture have done so much impressive work at such a young age. But of course, we all have a story to tell from beyond, before this point. So can you give us a little insight into your background and how you got to this point thus far? Um, so yeah, so I was born in Zimbabwe and then moved to the United Kingdom quite early on in my life. Um, and then I've grown up in the UK um, all of my life, went to school in the UK, all of my schooling years were in the UK. Now I'm at university in London um, studying medicine, which was quite a journey to get onto a medical degree. I think you have like a, the odds are like one in 15 or one in 20 get in. Um, so it's an extremely competitive process. And that's kind of how we got to where I am today. Um, yeah. Fantastic. And that is a very competitive process. It almost sounds like just getting into Google, a very competitive, very, very little people having that accessibility. So what inspired you to want to pursue a career in the medical profession? Um, so, so inspiration. I'm a person who's inspired by loads of things and sometimes even the most random things. Um, and I think probably the biggest inspiration came from almost seeing how people interact with society, how people interact. Um, like health is something that affects all of us. And just seeing that no matter what profession you're in or where you go, everybody is always affected by health. And then at school when I was in sixth form, um, I was always good at science and it just, the two worlds just almost aligned. And I think the thing that I was most interested in is how almost different people interact with healthcare in different ways. Like you you always find that concept where people kind of get to the end of their life or get old and they start thinking about healthcare a lot more. However, when you're my age, you don't really ever consider it. Right. And I thought things like that are just so interesting and I would love to kind of dig a little bit deeper because I'm sure there's more that I can find in there. That's very cool. So you are one of those people with just a, a continually inquisitive mind, which is always good. And that growth mindset is always so helpful. Yeah. Um, I think overhauling in a lot of industries, even the tech industry and healthcare, people are becoming a lot more aware of a lot of the disparities that are occurring in these spaces. So what led you to kind of want to address these issues in your learnings? So I, to almost paint a picture of the, the story, so I got to medical school um, and in the UK, you can go to medical school when you're 18 years old. So I got to medical school at 18 years old and I started learning how to, like how to identify different conditions, how to understand the pathophysiology of different conditions. However, a common theme that I was finding throughout all of this was that all of these conditions are being taught in one way and we're always getting one perspective on how they should present and how they should appear. And even the language that we're using, we're being told to look for the red rash. If you see a red rash, you're probably going to be thinking more this condition as opposed to this condition. Um, and this was probably five, six weeks into medical school. Mm -hmm. But I thought, oh, I'm only five or six weeks into medical school. So this is only the first part of the textbook. By the time right. we get midway or closer to the end, it will all start to make sense. I found that this wasn't the case. Um, and I ended up talking to other students um, who are older than me and further along the journey. And they were telling me that, yeah, to be honest, you're always going to get it on white skin. And then you kind of have to work backwards to identify how to spot these things on darker skins. And then 
that was kind of a an isolated piece of information that I had in my head up here. Then like up here, I also knew that, oh, there's healthcare disparities that exist in the UK, such as um, black women being five times more likely to die during childbirth. So these two things seemed isolated and I was very aware of them. However, when I kind of sat down um, to actually think about it, the dots were starting to connect that actually, some of these healthcare disparities may exist because people are not getting adequate training and enough teaching on them whilst they're learning. And then it's kind of like a full cycle, but nobody's connecting the dots of that cycle. Right, that is so interesting. And I definitely have seen those disparities over time in various countries, even in some of the world's most developed countries, we are still seeing those disparities for communities of color, um, for those in disability spaces as well. Um, so have you seen a lot of these disparities kind of manifest through the pandemic as well? And in what ways? Of course, so I, I think on a almost a simplistic level, the healthcare disparities that exist um, and that we see are just a reflection of the wider society because I think in healthcare sometimes we, we ignore the fact that healthcare is controlled by society and almost society is controlled by healthcare. Um, so the pandemic kind of allowed us to see that all of us were being affected by the same coronavirus, everyone in the US, in the UK, all around the world. However, disproportionately certain groups are being more affected than others all around the world. And we have to sit down and ask ourselves, like in the US, your healthcare system is completely different to the healthcare system that we have in the UK. However, the people who are more likely to die in the US of COVID and the people who are more likely to die of COVID in the UK were the same groups. So it's like, that's the reflection of the two societies that we're living in that actually both of these groups in the UK and the US may be marginalized. Um, in the UK, we saw that um, I think about this point last year, um, there were statistics going around saying, if you're a black person, you're four times more likely to die of COVID. Um, and I think if you were like South Asian, it was like three times more likely. Um, and then other minority ethnic groups were like two times more likely. And that similar trend was very similar in the US and in many um, Western world countries. Very much so. So it's it's, in, it's a trend of, of systematic things, if you will, it seems. And it spans oceans, it spans continents. Um, so that's very intriguing to understand that. Um, beyond that, when you were starting to get into the process of writing your book, could you kind of just walk us through from start to finish what that looked like, the research that occurred, kind of the process and the support that you had to garner? What was that process like for you? Yeah. So. Um... Like I mentioned before, um, it, was, it was something that I identified as an issue probably six weeks into my medical school. Um, however, I would say I, w I didn't feel empowered or strong enough to be able to challenge something which almost is, still is bigger than me. Um, so I kind of just said, you know what, um, the typical almost like what your parents will say to you, like you're not there to make friends, just read your books. Do your things. <laughs> <laughs> so I just sat down and read my books. But I think when there's something in the back of your head for so long, it's kind of a sign that that is the something that you probably should be putting your attention to. Right. And my thing was every single time I get to another topic of medicine, it's always the same. Like I'm always asking the question, what does it look like on darker skin? And it got to a point where I just got so frustrated and I thought, actually, you know what, I'm going to try and do the little that I can to address this. And when we started off, we didn't, in the in the very initial stages, we didn't know that it was going to be a handbook, but we knew the problem and we knew what we wanted to solve, how we were going to solve it. We hadn't quite envisioned that as of yet, but we had different ideas down on paper. Um, one of them being a handbook, one of them being like training sessions, one of them being a research paper. Um, and I can't remember, there was loads of other ideas. But we kind of sat down and thought, what is the most effective way to communicate this problem to people so that they can just see it? Right. And the easiest way to see something is seeing the picture. Right. Um, so that process then started. We were kind of set, OK, we're going to make a handbook and collect some pictures and see where this takes us. Our aim at the time was to only change the current space that we were in, so to change the department at my university. Um, and we thought, oh, well, I thought, well, if this is going to be easy, like get some pictures, how hard can it be? 
I think the first time I went to Google Images and any um, black person and any other person of color watching this or who's going to watch it back can tell you for free that when you type in, I don't know, a rash on darker skin on Google, you will really have a hard time. Mm. And in a modern day society, if you can't find things on Google, it's like almost where else do you turn? Right. Um, so then I started digging through anything I could find, like any medical textbooks, any um, research papers, any any private doctors who showcase their work, almost seeing if that's a route that we can take. But due to patient consent issues, that's a route that was quickly blocked off. Right. And I started to realize that actually this hill is bigger than I initially expected. Like the pictures just were nowhere to be found. Right. We did end up finding images just scattered in the most random places on the internet. Um, but yet again, we had the problem of consent. Like we couldn't get through to the people who posted those images online to ask, oh, this is what we're doing. Can we potentially use them? Um, eventually we then got a bank of, uh, I think initially we had about 90 images, which potentially could have made the book. However, what we found in the 90 images was that some of them were so rare, like conditions which were extremely rare, like one in 10 million. Um, and we thought actually, if we're going to show this to medical students and teach medical students using this resource, it may not be the most effective thing to show them a condition which is only seen on one in 10 million people because this won't improve anything because people will be like, oh, actually, that's only on one in 10 million. But on everybody else with a basic rash, this is what it looks like, it's the same as white skin. And then following on from that, we condensed our book down into, I think, 31 images. And that's when we decided that actually, here is the book, it's done. <laughs> Yes, that's amazing. And I think that you really spoke to just that calling in the back of your mind over time. I think that's super important for people to always acknowledge if there's that that thing that's speaking to them consistently over time, that it should be acknowledged because you never know what it could turn into and what it can blossom and become. Um, did you expect the publishing of your book to have such widespread impact? No way. <laughs> I think even funny story, in fact, I like initially when when the book was done, um, in fact, the bit that I forgot to add is I'm a very, I like to think of myself as creative in some aspects. So the book was done on a Word document. I still have the Word document on my laptop. Um, was it a was, Google Doc? Yes, it was a Google Doc. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still have it on my laptop and it was just pictures and words and it looks so ugly and I thought actually I want to really take time to to make even a front cover which is something that I can resonate with and it's funny because I made the front cover for the handbook in like 10 minutes on Photoshop um, but going back to the original question about um, did I expect the response no way did I expect even 1% of the response that was there. I expected some sort of response, but I was expecting that response to kind of be generated by, I'm going to tweet something, all of my friends are going to reshare it, and all <laughs> their friends will see it. And that was kind of it. Um, and then I think the moment hit me when I had um, like John Boyega from Star Wars sharing the work, um, Priyanka Chopra, sharing the work, Winnie Harlow sharing the work. And I was like, actually, like this has gone so far. Like I can't imagine who else knows about it right now. Yes, and that is insane. And even as I was doing my research before our talk, just finding you on Good Morning America, finding your articles and all your pieces in different places and spaces. So you've had such a widespread outreach. And I think that's why it's so significant to listen to that little voice in the back <laughs> of your head, right? Yeah. Um, and how has your life changed since the release of the book last year? Um, I wish I could say my life changed, but relatively it's still the same. I think the reason why not many things have changed like on the outside is because everything I do is like right now I'm talking at Google, one of the biggest companies in the world, but I'm sitting in my bedroom. <laughs> so there's been loads of opportunities that have come, but because of COVID we've been locked in our houses. Right. So I've had to sit at this desk. I think I could say my life has changed in the sense that 
from doing Mind the Gap has given me a lot more confidence and it's empowered me to be able to listen to those voices in my head when they come and actually do something about it. Because I think you never know where where things can take you. Like I think one of the biggest fears that I had initially was that, oh, actually, I've just tweeted this out. It's got 20,000 retweets. Loads of celebrities in the world are now asking for the work. The medicine community is all talking about it, but it's only 30 pages. So I started to have so much doubt within myself that actually all of this is fun and games right now. However, when it actually goes out, everyone's going to be like, oh, we were expecting a lot more. But clearly it has shown that something so something which started as an idea in my head and I only had the resources at the time to only produce 30 pages, but it started to shift and change medical care, change people's approach to diagnosing conditions in people's skin of color so much. And sometimes it's only 30 pages that it takes to be able to do all of that. Right. And I think in tech, we always have the term minimal viable product, right? And it's the MVP. It's just like that base thing. What can you get out to the public that can be used and iterated upon? So I feel like there's a much more expansive vision that's here. And so when you think of the research that you're doing, and when you think of this work specifically, what vision do you have for it moving forward? Um, so moving forward, I think from doing Mind the Gap and having our website, Black and Brown Skin. Um, I think one thing I've started to realize is that many people around the world have the same problem. However, nobody has the answer. So I think one thing that we want to do is kind of connect all of those dots and start to kind of build a community and grow that community so that people can have the answers to a lot of these problems that they have with healthcare. I think one thing that we are going to stay away from is kind of transitioning into you come to our website and we'll diagnose you straight away because right. we don't want to sell that false image of don't trust your healthcare professionals, trust us. Like we still want people to seek professional advice where possible. However, I think one thing that is not commonly practiced in the UK is that healthcare is, I, I don't think we empower the patients enough to seek out healthcare at places that are not healthcare settings. So often, people only interact with healthcare when they're in the hospital or at their GP or at a clinic or something like that. Whereas I think with the work that we're doing, I think I want to be able to empower people to also think about healthcare when you're at home sitting in bed on your phone, because healthcare is something that's ongoing 24 seven. Healthcare is your skincare routine in the morning, right. healthcare is what you choose to eat for breakfast, healthcare is did you go for a job this morning or what did you do? All of those things still link in with healthcare. So if we can educate some of the community that we're already serving on all of these things, information which to me is relatively simple because I'm in the medical field. However, to somebody else who's not in the medical field, maybe something they've never thought about. I think I just want the work that we're doing to bridge that gap and connect those two dots together. Excellent. Yeah, I think that lends to a lot about generational variances. Like when I think about my grandfather and the way that he thinks about his health care, it's a lot different than the way that we as a generation go about it. I think there's a lot more openness about mental health and well-being, especially through last year. I think there's a lot more emphasis on self-care and a lot of those practices and what that looks like. So I definitely can see how those two things would start to align and connect together. Um, yeah. Do you have a self-care routine that you implement for yourself? So mine's very simple, just wash, tone, moisturize, SPF. Love. <laughs> and if the skincare community is watching this, if I did that in the wrong order, I'm so sorry. <laughs> you did, that's, that's all you need, really. It's the bare minimum. <laughs> Keep yourself moisturized, drink your water, and we're all on a good path. Of that's course. awesome. And can you tell us a little bit more about your organization, Black and Brown Skin, and kind of the, the beginnings of how that came to light? Um, so when we... Um, me wrote Mind the Gap Handbook, one thing I, I knew was that it's not enough to just give people a handbook and say, read this and expect things which have been there way before my time to just change overnight. I know COVID did accelerate a lot of things. However, you're not going to accelerate 50 years of work in two months. Um, so then I thought one of the most effective ways to make this work sustainable is to create a website and to create an organization that being black and brown skin. 
um, black and brown skin um, as an organization were dedicated to improving the healthcare of people of color um, because I believe that the quality of your healthcare shouldn't be compromised due to the color of your skin. And I think with some of the healthcare disparities that currently exist, one could argue that that is currently what is happening. So our page, is, our page exists to champion and to be able to support people of color with healthcare needs. As things currently stand, we are operating in the form of an online encyclopedia. So there is about 100 pictures um, of different conditions and how they present on darker skins. And as we progress, I think this summer is actually the start of a transitioning phase for us. I think, like I said earlier, we want to connect more of the community together. So if I was to almost use a metaphor about what we want to do, um, I see black and brown skin. Um, in my head, it's like we're building a hospital. And in that hospital, we're going to have different departments dedicated to different needs. So we currently know that black women are five times more likely to die due um, during childbirth compared to their white counterparts. So in our metaphorical hospital, we will have a place for black women and maternal needs where they can get all the information and be championed on those respects. We also know that there is many other problems such as um, black men and mental health. I think black men have one of the highest suicide rates. However, when I've gone to look for resources or gone to look for tools, I haven't often found things which are sustainable organizations which are operating in that space. Um, so in our metaphorical hospital, we will have a space for that. And I think as things kind of grow, we'll have kind of more departments within our metaphorical hospital with black and brown skin being the main hospital. And our hospital, what we do, we cater to the needs of people of color. So that's kind of what I see from black and brown skin um, within the next five years. Um, and I, I just can't wait. Deep down inside, I know I, I have so much passion and so much hope that this will work. And in fact, the piece of paper which is on that wall is mm -hmm. kind of the blueprint. So technically, the blueprint is on call right now. Love it. <laughs> And it's there every day you're waking up, you're keeping your vision top of mind. That is amazing. And if people wanted to get involved or extend themselves, how would they be able to do that? Um, so we're actually going to look into bringing more people onto the team this summer as well, when we start to expand. Um, I think the simplest way to do it is to just drop us an email. Um, if you go to the website, there is a contact us page. If you drop us an email with interest, I think we'll be posting, hopefully, some roles, advertisement within the next month. And then it will be great to see a global connection as well. Um, that's the beauty of the internet right now. Um, if we could work with people in the US and the people in the UK, people in Germany, people in Africa, um, I think that would be amazing because then we are catering to the needs of people, not specifically to the needs um, of their society, if that makes sense. Right, that's amazing. And for those who are tuning in, all of the resources are available in the description below, and that includes a link to the handbook as well as information on the organization. So please go check it out when you do have time. That's so amazing. So I do want to pivot a little bit just in terms of your network of support in writing this book and kind of implementing this organization. Um, so you have been additionally supported by Margot Turner and Dr. Peter Tammany. Um, so how significant has it been to have that additional support from your lecturers and have that kind of guidance? Yeah, like it's been extremely, it's, it's been extremely helpful. I think one thing that I'm a big believer of is excellence is never individual. There's always somebody else or other people in the background every time you see a moment of excellence. Yes. Um, and I think in this case, if it wasn't for Margot, I don't think Mind the Gap would even exist in a physical form. Mind the Gap would have been something that stayed in my head forever. But because Margot, when I went to Margot with the idea for Mind the Gap, she allowed me to see that actually this is possible. This is how things work at a high university level, connected us, me, myself, and Peter Tammany together. Um, and she kind of allowed the work to, to grow. And I think from that, it gave me confidence to be like, actually, I can do this. Because I think sometimes when you're at university, I was the second year student. My course is five years, so I'll be looking at the older students who are in fifth year, 
and I'll be like, actually, like I'm only in my second year. There's nothing I can do because I'm only in my second year. I'm only 19. However, because of their extreme support, they're the ones who allowed throughout the whole process allowed to be able to get my up to where it is today. And I can't thank them enough. And every single time I do a talk, I just want to thank them so much. I think also in the process, um, of course, there was other people around me, such as my family, my friends, um, who were always supportive because it was a long journey. And I don't think everything was always going well. As, as much as it may seem like things have been going well from day one, um, think there's always bumps in the road. And I think having those people there at the bumps in the road is really helpful. And even having those people there when things are going great, is just really good to see people around you. Right, definitely. And in terms of when you think about like mentorship or sponsorship, if people, you said you didn't feel empowered to do this work early on. And so when you think of an individual who may be seeking that guidance or who may be seeking that mentorship from somebody, what advice would you give them about how to go about doing that? Um, I think the first piece of advice that I would give is sometimes it's important to know how to help yourself before you seek help from others. Right. Um, it's important to also know what help that you, you're you seeking out from this given individual. Because I think sometimes the mistake that people make is you just want to go and get a mentorship. They may not be the best person, but because you've seen their name, you've seen the type of things that they've done, you just put two plus two together and think it equals four. When in reality, maybe the mentor that you need is your friend or somebody else on your course who's also in a similar line of work to you. I think when approaching mentorship, um, or people to support your work, it's so important that deep down inside you know what your vision is and you know what your goal is. Because I think one of the most unfortunate things about the world is um, there is always going to be people out there who try to knock what you're doing down. Mm. Um, and I think one principle I almost live off is that talk is cheap, advice is cheap, but always take it kind of with a pinch of salt because people may be putting you onto things which actually make sense. But just because somebody gave you a piece of advice doesn't necessarily mean that that is what's best for you or that is what's best in general. Right. And I, you always have to be guided by your vision and why you're doing things. If you're guided by those two things, people's advice and people's whatever they want to add will kind of help to steer that boat in the correct direction. Very, very cool. Fantastic. And so looking forward just in your life, you said you're, you're only second year medical student? Third year. third year now. Just finished my third year. So. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> and so there's still much ahead of you. You still have two more years of school, but beyond school, like what do you think you see yourself doing after school is behind you? You've crossed that line envisioning yourself upon graduation. What does that look like for you? Um, sometimes I think it's really hard to capture what that looks like in my head because it still feels so far away right However, when I then say that I'm going to be starting my fourth year very soon it feels a bit too close <laughs> um, I think what that looks like for me sometimes I think deep down inside to myself is that the area of medicine that I'm going to go into in the UK doesn't currently exist mm. um, and it sounds like a very wild and a very bold statement because I couldn't describe what that area of medicine is right now. However, one thing I know is that I'm really passionate about healthcare for um, marginalized communities in the UK because I don't think anybody's doing enough to target those communities. And I think one thing that I think sometimes that we're really scared to do is address things for what they are. Um, it's very unfortunate, but in the UK, that statistic that I was talking about earlier with black women, a maternal child um, childbirth, the NHS, um, the National Health Service, acknowledge that that statistic exists. However, there is no target set in place to kind of reduce, reduce that statistic. Um, so I think I want to be in a place where those are the types of things that we're working on reducing. We're working on how can we connect with these communities which are not engaging with healthcare as much? How can we connect with them to make sure that they are engaging with healthcare. Um, 
like I said earlier, healthcare is not just coming to the hospital. I think one almost misconception we have in healthcare sometimes is that when people come to the hospital, that's when they need healthcare. When, right. in my opinion, sometimes it's too late. Like we're treating, we 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 then get to a point where we're treating problems rather than preventing causes. And I kind of see myself on the other side where I want to be in a space where we're stopping people from even getting to hospital in the first place. Right. Of course, it feels great if you have like a car accident or if you have a cancer which needs to be excited, something like that. But if there's things which can be prevented by, I don't know, stress reducing measures, healthy diets, stuff like that, I feel like that's kind of where I want to be. Currently, there is things which exist like that, like public health, general practice. However, I feel like I'm kind of somewhere in the middle and there is a there is space for me to create my own lane. And I think if I just keep chipping away at what I'm doing, eventually the lane will just be there and it will be like, wow. <laughs> That's absolutely true. And I, I can definitely say from my own perspective, like I had my own medical scare recently and it was like, yes, this impacts 80% of black women, 50% um, of women. And when I went to go do my own research, it was like non-existent almost. And it was very, very unfortunate uh, that that was the case. And I, I went to my doctor and I said, is there anything preventative that I can do? Is there anything that we can work on? She said, no, we just have to operate. Um, and I think that that is the, the experience that a lot of people, of people in general, people of color, people encountering tremendous medical issues sometimes have a tendency to experience. And I think that when you start to, to chip away at that lane, that is something that is going to be a transformative practice for the industry as a whole. So I know I see people in the comments like, I'm so proud of you, this is awesome. So this is, this is beautiful work. And I think it is something that is very inspirational. Um, and so we have work that you've done. It's not only medical focus, but it is also building equity, right? Um, it is also a working to establish some form of kind of reprieve for people who have been overlooked in the past. Um, so what advice do you have to this next generation, not only of, of aspiring medical professionals in the UK and the US and beyond, um, but those equity builders, those people who are interested in undoing the work that has been done and making a new pathway? What is your what is your words for those people? Um, I, I think my my biggest words, um, and I try to live by this all the time, is that one thing that a lot of people my age will kind of face is being told that you're too young. Um, and I feel like you're never too young. If we look at history and we look at everyone who's made significant changes in the world, they always started at a similar age. Um, however, they did not get their flowers until they were in their 30s or their 40s. And why? And that's because the nature of compounding, like things don't just happen overnight. Even with Mind the Gap, you saw Mind the Gap, but that didn't just happen overnight. That was, my, I could argue that Mind the Gap started five years ago. Right. Um, and it's kind of just compounding, doing that, those things that make you 1% better every day. So if you're trying to, I don't know, for example, if you're trying to follow a path such as the work that I'm doing, that could be simply just reading around the topic a little bit more so that every single day you're 1% better. By the time you get to the end of the year, you're 1%, you're 1%, you're 1%. They compound and they grow into something big. And then you start in next year on an even bigger scale. And I think it's kind of just allowing the nature of compounding to, to work and just forming those habits from very early on um, that will allow you to be able to go to wherever you want to go to. I think the misconception that we have these days because of social media it has its benefits and it has its drawbacks is that, I don't know, you post a picture, you get 20,000 likes, um, Drake sees it, now you've got a record deal. Um, when the reality is that's not quite how things work. Um, and on that note, while we're talking about social media, I think the positive of social media is now we have so much access and we can see so many things that are going on around the world and we can connect with so many people. So I'm speaking to you guys at Google right now. If you're in America, I'm in the UK, but this conversation can go on. So I think sometimes don't be afraid to also reach out to whoever inspires you all around the world because we're literally one Google meet away. Um, so 
just be bold, go out there. Like I said earlier, know why you're doing things, allow compounding to happen and just start to maintain those habits from day one. Like whether that be every morning you wake up, you read 30 minutes. Before you know it, two years down the line, the amount of knowledge that you've acquired is, is phenomenal. And now it's not me saying that, um, on that same note, it's not me trying to say that, oh, if you're not reading, then you're not gonna get anywhere. But whatever you choose to do, take it in very small chunks and just make sure that you work on that over like the space of a year, the space of two years, the space of five years. And then we'll still see around um, 10 years if you're still around. Fantastic. Amazing. And so now if you all were interested, all those tuning in, please feel free to drop your questions in the chat. Um, we'll start to go through our Q&A. Um, so our first question, having created such a global impact with Mind the Gap already, what do you think are the next steps to force curriculum changes amongst UK uni? Um, I think the unfortunate thing um, is that sometimes I think we spend so long trying to prove that problem exists that that process tires you out and then the, the curricula doesn't change. I think the next steps in UK unis, especially in the healthcare space, is making sure that students, wherever they are on their individual quarters, continue to flag up when they find that actually we've been taught about meningitis, but there was no pictures on darker skin. I think if students, if it continues to come from the students, eventually I think we'll start to see an overhaul, a big shift. Like I literally just said, um, things compound over time. And for the curricula to change, I feel like it's going to be a compounding process as well. So Mind the Gap was probably the first pillar to fall. However, we still need individuals in their given spaces to allow those things to compound, to compound, to compound, so that by the time I finish medical school, I can look at the first years and think, actually, when I was in your position, we didn't have this. However, I've now done my five years and you guys are gonna have a completely different five years to me. That's fantastic. Um, next question, do you have any goals outside of medicine? Um, what hobbies and interests do you have outside of your field of work? Um, so one of my biggest interests, um, I, I would just say all of the random interests that I have, I'm very interested in like sneaker collecting. Okay. Um, sneaker um, head. <laughs> right, it's funny because right now I've got my favorite trainers on just for some confidence for this talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, and my goals outside of like what I'm doing, I think my biggest goal is I want to get to a place in my a point in my life where I, I, I'm able to help so many people at one given point. I think with Mind the Gap, one thing it opened my eyes to is that you don't always need to be everywhere to be able to help people. Like Mind the Gap was helping people when I was asleep. Um, Mind the Gap was helping people when I'm in lectures. If I can get to a point in my life where I'm able to help people and give back to the communities that are very underserved, and um, I think that's kind of where I want to get to. I think on a more personal level as well, I think I really want to be a role model for other black boys specifically growing up, especially in the UK. I think one unfortunate thing that we tend to have sometimes is as black boys, there isn't many role models in kind of the public eye that you see. A lot of the role models that we have, um, like say for me growing up, one of my role models was Thierry Henry. Um, the other black men that you see in the public eye will be either footballers, rappers. Um, and it's not always people who can relate to you on a closer level. Um, I would still say that I still listen to some rappers and they kind of are on that blueprint up there. Um, can you give me a top three? Nipsey Hussle. Um, always. <laughs> <laughs> Nips, uh, Nips, I really like Nipsey Hussle. Um, I listen to Victory Lap all the time. Um, I and I think I'll leave it there because okay. I, Nipsey is good enough. Yes, he there. is the bar. He is the standard. <laughs> <laughs> That is amazing. And so in terms of when you think about like, I, I want I want to kind of go on this Nipsey tangent a little bit um, <laughs> in terms of how he inspires you and, and what what that lends to for you. What 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 does he bring out of you? 
Um, I think with Nipsey Hussle, the thing that inspires me the most is that Nipsey had that self-belief that is, is just inspiring. It's like on a lot of his earlier pieces of work, he talks about how he sold his mixtape for $100. And in this day and age, I don't think any of us would pay £100 for an artist's album. Right. <laughs> but he had so much confidence and so much faith, and his vision was he knew where he wanted to get to that. He knew that if he sells this at $100, he's providing enough value that enough people will buy it and see that actually he's a good artist. He very easily could have gave that away for free for almost um, publicity reasons. However, he has so much faith and vision. And I think you can kind of see it. Um, one thing I love about artists is when they grow as an artist as well. When you listen to Lip Nipsey's earlier music, um, and it's not necessarily always positive things, it's things that happen in like the hood. However, you kind of see that progression as he grows and he's always talking about the marathon continues and even rest in peace to Nipsey, but the marathon is literally continuing even after his past because of the things that they set up in Crenshaw. Um, they had, he had his own store, he had his own clothing line, things which I'm sure are still paying back um, to this day. When he was rapping, he owned all of the masters to his tapes. So those things are still paying him today. And even in his death, he's someone whose vision still was so powerful that he knew exactly where he wanted to go and didn't let the industry kind of phase him by all of that. I definitely understand. I have a, a wonderful friend here in the city. He was at the Marathon store opening and got a photograph of Nipsey. It's so close. You can see his cuticles. You can see the tattoos on his hands. Mm -hmm. And we have it right at our front door. <laughs> so every time we walk out, it's something that we see consistently to let us know the marathon continues. When I That's finally get to come to America, I really want to go. To yes. <laughs> I want to see it in, in real life. Yes. Even if you drive by it for like 30 seconds and then continue with our day, I'll be content. <laughs> that is amazing. Um, and beyond that, I know you had mentioned in terms of like reading a little bit and some books. Do you have any favorites or recommendations that you would share with the audience? Um, I think one of my favorite books on the same kind of line of things is Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. Oh, uh -huh. uh, more about the Nike story. I think that book is is amazing. I think it gives you a real life insight into what it's like to build something as big as Nike. Um, it kind of, what I love about it the most is just real. Like a lot of books that I've read about um, almost like business and self-help, they'll be like, I just don't feel like they connect on a personal level. Right. Whereas one being a sneakerhead um, and a lot of my trainers are Nike. Um, <laughs> I think it's amazing to see how he was even traveling to Japan in times where America and Japan were not exactly on the strongest foot. Um, he was spending about 2,000 pounds, which in the 1960s was a lot of money, on just giving it to someone and saying, please send me some shoes in America. Um, and it not coming, all of the competition that he faced, the struggles that he had with individuals and people not believing in his vision. However, he had an alignment and knew that actually I want to sell trainers and I want to go forward. And it was just amazing to see that kind of that, that journey of growth and to see where they are now today. That's a fact. And do you have a favorite set of trainers? Um, my favorite set of trainers, I would even lift my leg up, but I don't think that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> my favorite pair of shoes that I own is Jordan 1, Satin Red. My favorite pair of shoes that I don't own um, is the Jordan 4, the Off-White Jordan 4s, the collaboration with Virgil. Okay, noted. That is fantastic. Okay, we have a few more questions coming in. Oh, what's your favorite football team? Oh, I'm a big, big, big Arsenal fan, unfortunately. <laughs> Is that I'm, I'm not familiar super, but I really am trying to get more involved. Is there someone who would come for you for that answer? <laughs> um, so what what it is, is Arsenal, we've kind of been, we had our glory days, um, probably in the early 2000s, like we were one of the best teams in the UK. However, since then, we've just been falling and falling and falling and falling. And this year is actually our worst season. So it's like we're just on a decline. <laughs> Listen, but you die hard holding on hope. 
<laughs> awesome. Next question. Um, have you considered a version of your training for EMTs slash paramedics? Um, this was mentioned by the submitter that their EMT training in the U.S. had nearly all pictures of white patients. Yes. Yeah, so initially we considered splitting the book into different specialities. But one thing that we realized is that, like I said earlier, healthcare is healthcare. So it's, I think it's important for us to just include all of the information in one space. However, having said that, Mind the Gap can still be used by paramedics. Um, it's actually being used by the London Ambulance Service as we speak. Um, so it's kind of all of these things are kind of transferable between specialities. Noted. OK, so it can be expansive in terms of industry. Yeah. Fantastic. Oh, we had some comments. Dad said you should join Chelsea. So we've, we've got some feedback already <laughs> about the topic. Fantastic. And so when you consider moving forward, would there be anything else that you would want to author in terms of additional books about other conditions? Um, I think at this moment in time, I haven't entirely thought about that yet. I think my mind um, is in the space where I want to see Mind the Gap grow. Um, in medicine, we have a book called Kuma and Clark, which is like the biggest medicine textbook in the UK. Mm. Maybe it's there in America, I'm not sure. But um, I want to see Mind the Gap grow into a handbook, which is equally as big as that. Noted, noted. Well, Malone, thank you so much for our talk today. It was a pleasure meeting you. And I know one day we will have our moment together to be able to go to the Google office and eat lunch once the world open back, well, once the world opens back up. So I'm so excited to meet you in the future. And thank you so much for all the work that you've done. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity as well. Hopefully yes. one day I'll get to see Google offices, not from my bedroom. <laughs> yes, exactly <laughs> that. Exactly that. You have a wonderful rest of your day. Same to you as well. <laughs>